Hello everyone, Nubasaurus here, and welcome to my creative world. Um, <laughs> just a bit, uh, a bit of an update on some some computer biz that's been going on. Um, so for those of you who are aware of the Blue Wave Mark II project, uh, I got some bad news for you. That project has been terminated. Um, it, it basically was getting too big and too complex for me to keep track of everything, and more problems were showing up than I could fix. So it was, uh, it was actually kind of ripping itself apart per se uh, and it just got out of hand so I, I basically just gave up uh, and uh, you know scrapped the project so that unfortunately is not going to be finished anytime soon but I did start another computer project and this is it uh, I will point out something it is ridiculously small in fact it's going to get smaller this is all the uncompressed wiring right now this is all the compressed wiring um, so this is, uh, <laughs> it's, it, like I said, it's, it's incredibly small, it's incredibly, incredibly powerful if I designed this correctly. Um, and what I decided to call it is, get this, I decided to call it Skittle Bits. Uh, and the reason for that is because you'll notice the multicolored bus here. Uh, if you're familiar with electronics, basically, uh, electronics engineers will color code, uh, bus wires based on their representation, or, or their, uh, bit value. So, bit one would be brown, bit two would be red, bit three would be orange, and so on. And so what I did was I obliged to the color code uh, and color coded them accordingly. Well, it ended up having this really cool rainbow effect, and it reminded me of Skittles. So that's why <laughs> that's why I named it that. Um, but like I said, it's uh, it's it's incredibly incredibly small, incredibly incredibly powerful theoretically. Um, and the nice thing about this is because it's so simple. I like I know this looks complicated, but the logic is so simple. Uh, that it could theoretically be built in survival, and that's actually what I plan on doing. Um, but I figured real quick I'd just go over some of the, the features of this guy. So the hardware is based off of the 8085 microprocessor, which is a really powerful um, chip in its class. Uh, it's an 8-bit chip, so this is an 8-bit microprocessor. Um, but what made it so powerful was they multiplex the address and data bus so this is what we've got here we've got uh, an IO port and this actually ports the address as well as the data um, and of course that can be latched using ALE so if you have an external register you can latch that register using ALE and it'll store uh, the address uh, but it can um, it has the ability to access uh, the 8085 has the ability to access up to 65,536 uh, memory locations, or 64K. This one can only access, because it's an 8-bit address, um, 600, or 256 uh, memory locations, which is still pretty good. Um, but it also has the ability to have as many interrupts as you want. Uh, the 8085 had six interrupts. Um, five of them were fixed vectors, and one of them was a uh, programmable vector but it all was uh, designed to be combined with a programmable uh, interrupt chip. So what you could do is you could tie that interrupt to an interrupt chip and you could have as many interrupts as you want. And so that's kind of the, um, the thing that I was going for here. Uh, we've got the interrupt acknowledge and so what that would be is that would be the read line for the interrupt chip. And so what you'd do is you'd have the interrupt chip control your interrupts and it would prioritize them and set up opcodes for you and then uh, this CPU would then port in, as if it was memory, the opcode and the vector um, based on the interrupt. And so what's nice is you only have one interrupt pin on here, but it's expandable to as many as you'd like. Um, and then, of course, as far as physical hardware is concerned, uh, it's pretty simple, if I may say so myself. And when I say simple, I mean, like, really simple. Uh, so we've got five registers right here we've got a b uh program counter stack pointer and the temporary register um eight function alu uh eight bit register uh eight bit flag register uh, and all eight flags are used but they are um pretty powerful flags if i do say so myself like we've got bit check we've got uh uh what else was there we've got aux carry stuff like that just Stuff that you probably wouldn't ever use, but uh, they're there, and they're all accessible via jump command. So uh, you can, in fact, 
um, use them accordingly. But uh, we've got a separate incrementer and decrementer over here, uh, and that's actually connected directly to the registers, and what that's for is for the program counter and stack pointer addressing. Uh, and the reason for that is because when we address from the program counter, we want it to increment. Uh, and when we address from the pr uh, stack pointer, we want it to decrement. So what that does is it sets up a pre-ink or post-decrement value up on the port here. And that just ensures that we get the, um, the correct address. And then as far as the wiring is concerned, I was able to keep it extremely simple. Uh, because what I did was actually split the bits up into the control uh, lines themselves. So what we've got is we've got these first two bits that actually determine the function. You have uh, you have four functions. You have control, you have branching, you have ALU functions, and you have uh, data control functions. And so then what we've got is based on those two bits, these next six bits will do different things. So in data control, um, these first three bits will represent the destination, and these last three bits will represent the source. So the first two bits will represent a register. It can be A, B, stack pointer, or program counter. And if the uh, third bit is on, it's actually the port based off of that register. So what that means is uh, if my source was, uh, say, 100, well, that means that it'll port the data in the A register to the port and latch ALE and that whatever is in register A will become my address and then whatever stored in address um, in that address in memory will then be ported to the A register and so that's what that means um, or rather other way around but you, you know you get the idea so that just makes um, makes the um, opcode extremely versatile and the wiring extremely simple um, now that said, it's able to run about 128 instructions as is, um, I think, roughly. It, it can run all of its move instructions and all of its um, arithmetic instructions, uh, but it's still got a, a bit of a ways to go. Uh, I still need to figure out the branching and the control. Uh, the control is pretty much done. This all just needs to be hooked up to its various control lines, but uh, branching is a little bit more difficult, um, and so the whole thing... Uh, to make this a little easier is actually uh, each instruction is split up into multiple machine cycles and clock cycles. So it won't take one clock cycle per instruction. It actually takes maybe 10 or 12. Uh, but that does mean, yeah, but th that number is variable. So if you have a, a less powerful instruction, it'll take up less clock cycles than one that's maybe a little bit more powerful. So that makes the computer uh, extremely versatile in that manner because it doesn't waste clock cycles uh, it's always always doing something uh, and that's you know just helps speed it up a little bit and then of course we've got control lines for uh, reading memory but we've also got an IOMEM um, bit here and basically if that's off it'll access uh, memory but if it's on we can access IO and the nice thing about this is when you port out uh, it ports out a um, I/O selector bit first, or byte, I should say, uh, and latches it with ALE, and then sends or receives the data. So what that means is you can actually access up to 256 I/O devices as well. And this was also a feature on the 8085. Um, so that, like I said, should uh, should make it pretty powerful. So so far we've got, you know, 256 bytes of memory, 256 I/O locations, and theoretically an infinite number of interrupts and it's extremely small so <laughs> you can see the uh, the benefits of something like this um, and I mentioned that like I said you could theoretically make this in survival and I said that I was going to uh, this the reason why I'm trying to make this so small and so powerful is because like I said I want to try and build this in survival uh, but I don't want to be you know mining up you know six and a half continents worth of redstone to do it so that's really the purpose of this build um, but other than that, it's you know just something that, you know fun that I thought would be a cool challenge to take on. And so far, I'm really proud of the of the results. Um, you know, like I said, it's small, powerful, you know, all the things that I wanted uh, wanted the Blue Wave Mark II to be. Except you know, Blue Wave was large and not as powerful. So, but yeah, like I said, I'm I'm proud of of what this thing has become, and uh, I can't wait to uh, to finish it up. Um, hopefully we'll be able to finish it fairly soon. It's actually coming along quite nicely, and when I do, I might uh, run some demo programs on this thing because I'm really, really excited to see what this thing can do. Uh, but that said, I figured that would I, this would just be a progress update for that. 
Um, and uh, that's all I've got to show you. So without further rambling, I'll, uh, I'll say goodbye. So thanks for watching. Um, hope to see you when this is released. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.